To begin, we acknowledge that the Eastern Townships are situated on the unceded ancestral territory of the Wabanaki Nation, the Undakina. These lands were taken in an act of colonial violence and erasing of the history that came before. Today, we acknowledge that history and say, with the words given, us to, given to us by Abenaki friends, Kolom Payomba, Wambanakiak, Andakewank, you are welcome on the Abenaki territory. Nous reconnaissons que les cantons de l'Est ou l'Estrie sont situés sur le territoire ancestral et non cédé de la nation Wabanaki, le Nzakina. <clears throat> With that, welcome to the 22nd Robin Burns Lecture in memory of uh, former Bishop's History Professor and co-founder of the ETRC, the Eastern Townships Resource Center, or Centre de Resources pour l'étude des cantons de l'Est. Uh, je vous souhaite la bienvenue ce soir. And welcome also to February, uh, which is Black History Month here and everywhere. My name is David Webster and I'm uh, the new president of the ETRC. And this lecture series is in the spirit of Robin Burns, after whom it's named, sharing academic knowledge and research about the townships with the community. The mission of the ETRC remains in this spirit to preserve the region's unique Anglophone heritage while contributing to the community's vitality. At the same time, the ETRC recognizes that we need to question the traditional and popular understanding of who developed the Eastern Townships and to recognize the contribution of other groups and communities who have called the townships their home and walked upon these lands for many generations. We've tried to cover this in past ETRC lectures about the Jewish communities of the townships, about the Abenaki, about immigration to this place and so on. So tonight's event, not only features a lecture by uh, townships born researcher Sunita Nigam, who we're delighted is here, uh, but also marks the launch of the new exhibit that she curated with the involvement of ETRC director Fabian Bill, who tell us about it at the end of tonight's session on black histories of the Eastern townships on display in the Quad at Bishops and soon to be online. The launch of this effort, this exhibit is an effort to make less known histories visible um, to, uh, those who have not always been allowed to be visible in their own history here in this place. So I encourage you to check out the exhibit. And with that, let me turn over to Sonia Patanode of Bishop's University to introduce our guest speaker. Hello, my name is Sonia Patanode and I will be introducing Dr. Sunita Nigam. She's a settler academic of mixed Indian, Serbian, Irish and British ancestry. She grew up on unceded Wabanaki territory in the Eastern townships and she holds a PhD in English from McGill University and completed a two-year SSHRC Shirk postdoctoral fellowship in theater and performance studies at York University in 2021. Dr. Nigam has published on the racial, gender, and class dimensions of performance in Quebec and Mexico, including stand-up comedy, blackface minstrelsy, burlesque, activist theater, and urban design campaigns. Beyond her academic work, Sunita works as a consultant in the community sector across Quebec. Before I turn it over to our guest, I would like to take a moment to inform you that after the presentation, we will have a 15 minutes period for question and answer session. So you can write your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. And now, please welcome Dr. Sunita Nigam. Thank you so much, David and Sonia. And thank you also to the ETRC for the invitation to come and speak with you all this evening. The focus of my talk tonight is twofold. On the one hand, it is about acknowledging the role that Black people have played in shaping the Eastern Townships over time and continue to play in generating the Eastern Townships as a living region today. On the other hand, it is an invitation into an account of my personal process of researching Black histories in the Eastern Townships, which I propose arises out of the tension between what we do know and what we don't know. This talk is in many ways a response to the gaps in my own knowledge about Black histories and histories of people of color in the townships while growing up here. And then upon returning to live here after nearly a decade of living in and writing about urban centers across North America. My doctoral project, which is rooted in the discipline of performance studies, focused on the role that different, often socially marginal cultural producers, dancers, musicians, DIY designers, 
DJs and squatters have played in ur urban placemaking from the 1960s to the present. After spending many years researching and writing about the racial histories and cultural practices that have made cities like Montreal, New York, and Mexico City the places that they are today, I return to the Eastern Townships with new perspectives and questions about the ways in which race has shaped and been shaped by this rural part of Quebec, just a short drive from uh, just a, a short drive north of the US-Canada border. This place, so different from the large metropolises I had been used to thinking about, I knew had arisen out of its own distinct histories of migration, movement, colonialism, set settlement, and departure. And by its own network of labor and cultural practices generated from the social margins. I'd always known this intuitively, having grown up here, moving between the home of my grandparents, who immigrated to the townships from India in the 1960s, and the microcosm of a family restaurant that employed people from all over the world. But growing up, I never had access to a larger regional narrative about the role that racialized immigrants and passersby have played in making this place what it was and is today. When, while researching a different project, I started coming across accounts about the Black servants who were brought to the Eastern Townships for summers at a time by their employers from the US South, I wanted to know more about what their experiences here had been like. Was there a local Black community with whom these people could socialize? What did, what did they do for entertainment in between long hours of household work? Did they go to church on Sundays? And how were they treated by the locals here? While I haven't yet found answers to many of these questions, my curiosity about these people set me on a path of looking into what we know about Black histories in this part of the world. I was inspired by many mentors, scholars, and historians of Black Canada and Quebec. People like Karina Vernon, who has ded dedicated much of her career to excavating an incredible archive of Black writing from the Canadian prairies to transform inherited understandings of what prairie literature looks and sounds like. Charmaine Nelson, who has done vital work in correcting self-congratulatory Canadian narratives about slavery in North America that paint Canada and Quebec exclusively as safe havens for freedom seekers rather than as places that also have their own painful legacies of racialized slavery. Dorothy Williams, who has examined Quebec's Black histories from the lenses of race, gender, demography, economics, culture, and language, and published several books and resources on the subject, including the first pan-Canadian toolkit for the teaching of Black history from K through 12. Sadia Hartman, who has written indispensable work on the silences in the Black archive of the Americas and developed the concept of critical fabulation, which, which strains against the limits of the archive to pay homage to the people who lack representation within it. I was also inspired by local Black activist movements in the townships and Quebec, especially the present day work of Aïssé Touré and Angélique Gauguin Couture, founders of the digital platform Black Estrie which showcases the present day artistic and entrepreneurial contributions of Black people in the region as a local response to the now transnational Black Lives Matter movement. And the historian Webster, who uses rap music to revise Black histories of Quebec for popular audiences. There are more activists and scholars that have informed my thinking about Black histories in the townships than I have time to name here. But I emphasize a few of them now to situate Black histories in this region within larger contexts of provincial, Canadian, and transnational histories, activism, and scholarship. While the extent of my archival research on Black histories in the townships so far has been limited by constraints related to the pandemic, as well as the large number of archives located in and around the region, I have still been able to exchange with a number of archivists from across the townships about materials they have pertaining to Black history. This process has so far revealed that though there are many gaps and silences in our collective archives 
and memories about these stories, there are also some telling fragments that have been preserved about Black life in this part of the world. At the Missisquah His Historical Society in Stanbridge East, for example, rests a ledger from the store of the slave-owning loyalist Philip Luke in saint Armand that documents the purchases of a woman named Flavia over the span of 1832. Flavia was a Black woman whose name is never recorded before or after this year. As historian and heritage, heritage consultant Heather Darch has written, quote, we don't know her age or if she was married or had children. We don't know if she was born here in Africa, the United States, or even England. We don't know where or when she died. Her name does not appear in census records, baptismal notices, or death registers. She exists only in brief notations found in Philip Luke's Saint Armand's store ledger, along with the items she purchased and the labor she traded as payment over the course of one year. Still, end quote, sorry. Still, Darch is able to glean much from these notational fragments. As she, as she writes, quote, Flavia's purchases reflected her life, end quote. In Darch's text, all that we don't know about Flavia's life exists in a generative, even luminous tension with what we do know. Quote, she bought wood chips, corn, hay, mutton, sheepskin, and mackerel. There are no feminine items such as ribbons, mirrors, and sewing, sewing accessories. Whereas other customers routinely purchased coffee, tea, tobacco, sugar, salt, and rum, only, uh, only Flavia's purchases of tobacco could be classed as an extravagance. What is most revealing is how Flavia paid for her purchases. From, from, sorry, from February to December, she draws dung, chops cords of wood, cuts logs, plows, sows corn, mends fences, works the road, reaps rye, shaves sheep, and cares for the potato yard." End quote. As Darge is careful to point out, Flavia's labor was not like that of white women. She writes, quote, in the interest of extracting as much agricultural work from as many able able-bodied Black people as possible, white landowners made no distinction between Black men and women when it came to hard labor." End quote. One of the reasons I use Darch's compelling reading of the Luke Ledger here is because it resonates with what, have I, what I have experienced to be the process of doing Black histories in the townships more broadly discovering fragments that are all too frax fractional. After all, what can one year of purchases tell us about a person's entire life? And reconstructing all one possibly can from what little we do know, piecing together the fragments to form a fuller picture while acknowledging all the questions that still remain and the answers that may never be recovered. Take another example, the case of Eliza Rickard who in the archives of the Bibliothèque et Archives Nationales du Québec, TELUS arrived from Guadeloupe on April 11th of 1911 to work in Bromptonville in the home of an E.W. Tobin MP, a prominent local businessman and member of the House of Commons under Sir Wilfrid Laurier. Eliza arrived to Quebec as part of several fleets of young women from Guadeloupe who disembarked at the Windsor port of Montreal to work as domestic servants in bourgeois households throughout the province. These women would carry out their daily work for $5 per month at a time when their white counterparts were paid $11 to $15 for the same work. I've so far been able to learn little else about the life of Eliza Rickard. I do not know whether for example, she was still under the employ of Tobin when he purchased the Bromptonville mansion known as Woodhaven in 1930, which boasted 27 rooms, eight fireplaces, and three stairways. Or if she was, or it, sorry, or if she was like hundreds of other Guadeloupian domestics deported by the Canadian government, government back to Guadeloupe following racist reactions to their presence in Canada. 
This was a time when racist immigration laws systematically disallowed the entry of people of color and other so-called undesirable immigrants, with some exceptions when labor demands could not be met by white Canadians and Europeans. Through a system of careful legislation, policy, and corruption, Canada went to great lengths in the early 20th century to keep Black Americans from immigrating here. The Canadian Department of Immigration bribed doctors with monetary rewards to turn Black migrants away at the border and to inflict invasive and unnecessary examinations as a deterrent from entering Canada. Notably, a historical analysis of media and public opinion in the early 20th century reveals that while white, white Canadians were staunchly opposed to Black immigration, racism was perceived as an American problem that was foreign to Canada and which could be avoided as long as Black people could be kept out of the country entirely. And I want to note here that this reflex to disavow racism as an American problem, as opposed to a Canadian or Quebec problem, is one that continues to come up again and again in Canadian and Quebec media debates and public discourse about anti-Black racism. I'm thinking in particular about media scandals surrounding contemporary performances of Blackface in Quebec, as well as a discourse about anti-Black policing. For those of you wanting to learn more about this topic, I recommend Robin Maynard's, Maynard's 2017 book, Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present, which has also been translated into French, by the way. But to return to the story of Eliza Rickard, it is also possible that she, like her fe fellow Guadalupian domestic worker, Marie Didet, decided to leave the household in which she was employed because of being lent out to other households without her consent. The case of Marie Didet, in fact, featured in a prominent Montreal legal case in which her employer, a Mr. K. E. Brassard, brought a charge of breach of contract against Didet for leaving her employment with him. The case was eventually dismissed and Didet was allowed to leave. One sassy Quebec Chronicle article headline covering the case read, quote, colored domestics are getting wise, do not want to work perpetually for $5 a month, end quote. Cases like those of Didet remind us that despite the patently racist conditions in which they lived and worked, these women found ways both small and large of articulating and embodying a politics of resistance and self-determination. I want to turn now to a different kind of source material that has been productive for learning about how ideas about blackness have circulated and settled in the townships, namely newspaper archives. If you look at the archives of the Sherbrooke Daily Record in the early 20th, 20th century, for example, you'll find that like elsewhere in North America at the time, the stages of the Eastern townships were on the one hand animated by performances of blackface minstrelsy and on the other bustling with the offerings of Montreal based jazz musician, musicians who toured in the region playing to audiences hungry for the sounds of real jazz. Blackface minstrelsy, which was a a wildly popular live entertainment form in North America in the early 20th century involved the use of song, dance, and comedic monologues performed by usually white men and women who blacked up their faces with burnt cork to perform caricatures of blackness. Local reporting on carnivals and fancy dress masquerades in the region in the 1910s reveals that dressing in blackface was incredibly common during these events. The archives of the Sherbrooke Daily Record from the time contain advertisements for minstrel shows from East Angus, Georgeville, Sherbrooke, North Hatley, Danville, Cowansville, Lennoxville, Windsor, Drummondville, and beyond. This phenomenon attests to the fact that stereotypes of and a fascination with blackness occupied the cultural or racial imagination of the townships from the 1910s through the 1930s. 
And I think that there is much interesting work to be done on what we, we might describe as the development of the racial imaginary of the townships through the interaction with ideas about racial difference over time. And here I want to point to the work of Jamaican American poet, essayist and playwright, as well as founder of the Racial Imaginary Institute, Claudia Rankine, who describes the project of thinking about the racial imaginary as a process of demystifying the imagined ideas, both conscious and unconscious, that people have about race to better understand how, even though it is an invented concept, race nevertheless operates with extraordinary, with extraordinary force in our daily lives. With the advent of the jazz age in the 1920s, the townships came alive with the syncopated rhythms of jazz music as black jazz bands from Montreal toured throughout the region. Advertisements from the time betray a local fascination with real jazz music and the elite a uh, dancing academy on King Street in Sherbrooke promised to teach the real jazz, the African-American style of dance that arose alongside the music. The, the townships also saw a re jazz revival in the late 1940s through the early 1960s when world-class jazz musicians like Louis Metcalf, Gene Cooper, and white jazz composer Galt McDermott, two-time Grammy Award winner and alumnus of Bishop's University, came to play at various venues, including Bishop's. Louis Metcalf and his international band even opened Sherbrooke's first commercial exposi exposition in April 1949. The township's jazz scenes of the 1920s and 1950s uh, connected the region to a Black diasporic network and served as an important site for the performance of Black culture in this area. There are a number of other important punctual moments in which the cultures, talents, and labors of Black people come to the fore in townships history, including in the 1940s through the 1960s, when a number of Black athletes, especially hockey and baseball players, um, as well as boxers, came through the region to play for a season or a game. In the 1940s, players Herb Carnegie, Ossie Car Carnegie, and Manny McIntyre even starred on the Sherbrooke Seniors as the much lauded Trio des Noirs, the only colored line in organized hockey. And here I'm citing the work of Andy Holman, history professor at Bridgewater State University. In 2016, the, the Black population of the Eastern Townships was nearly 4,000 people, with the vast majority concentrated in Sherbrooke. While the Black population in the, in, this, in the region today only represents about 1% of the total Black population of Quebec, it remains a population in full expansion. To be sure, with provincial efforts to encourage immigration to rural regions, this population has nearly doubled in the last 10 years and is over eight times bigger than it was in 1996. The majority of this population hails from countries that were colonized by French, France and Belgium. And today, much of the township's black population is made up of second and first generation immigrants. Perhaps one of the most exciting examples of black history in the making of, uh, sorry, of black history in the making in the townships today are the growing activist movements and platforms that are generating spaces for black community and solidarity, as well as public platforms for teaching the general public about the experiences and contributions of black residents in the region. In 2020, law students and activists Ornella Yele and Deborah Orian Akpavi, Akpavi sorry, organized the Sherbrooke March Against Systemic Racism, which attracted over 3,000 participants. Following the march, a group of Black residents of the townships, including Felina Barros, Abigail Nzeba, Greta Sinzo Bakwira, Love Alonga, and Riziki Makandama, founded Cher Noir, which is working to create a space of unity, self-sufficiency, and well-being for the Black population of the townships. 
And in 2020, Aïssé Touré and Angélique Gagin Couture launched Black Estrie, a digital platform that shines the spotlight on the talents of the Black communities of the region. In 2021, the Touré Gagin Couture duo also created the web series Personne n'en parle that deals with topics relevant to the region's Black communities. It is remarkable and worth highlighting that so many of these activist movements have been led and sustained by the work of women and overlap with, with feminist projects. Because it is important to me as a scholar to share what I've been learning about Black histories and present realities with the general public in the townships, I've collaborated with the ETRC to create a public exhibit called Black Histories in the Eastern Townships. Today, we are launching this exhibit both as a virtual object and an outdoor display now installed in the Bishop's University quad. And this ex exhibit shines light on how the townships have been shaped by histories of Black labor, cultural production, creative intellect, resistance, and activism. It includes texts from scholars uh, scholars and historians of Black Canadian and Quebec history, including Dorothy Williams, Charmaine Nelson, Sean Mills, Andy Holman, and Heather Darch, and from local Black activists, specifically Aïssé Touré and Angélique Gagin Couture. A number of these texts are illustrated by the works of contemporary Black artists who use their creative practices to respond to elements of Black history in the province. The exhibit also includes two newly commissioned artworks by artists Anna Jane McIntyre and Emmanuel Jacques, who recently completed a residency at the Adelaar Gallery in Freelisburg, focused on responding to the oral histories about Black life in the uh, Brome Missisqua area in the 18th and 19th centuries. With her diptych, Par Parti du Paysage, The Freedom Pickers 1 and 2, Jacques recreates the landscapes of Mount Pinnacle in Freelisburg by layering the names of a dozen Black residences, residents of the Eastern Townships found in the store ledgers of loyalist shopkeepers in the region. The font used to create the stamps for the landscapes called U.S. Declaration is inspired by the U U.S. Declaration of Independence. The font references the period in which many loyalists came to the region, some with enslaved Black people. With Jacques' studies, Black residents of the townships are presented as intrinsic to the land and landscapes, even as their names are sometimes obscured or difficult to decipher. With her sculpture Tress, Mesh de, che de Cheveux, uh, McIntyre lists her media as a cedar fence post, antique nails, cement, hardware, paint, toy box, blood, sweat, tears, mixed emotions, ghost patina, stories, rumors, fragments of history, time. Her mixed media crossroads sculpture, measuring seven feet tall, topped with the pole star and set on wheels, conjures a nomadic, nomadic cedar tree, a tree considered to be a talisman of strength and resilience, particularly in turbulent times. Branches, like choose your own adventure signposts, point toward different paths to take. Tress, mesh de cheveux, asks viewers to listen very carefully. Its branches feature a small wind chime made of three anti antique nails, similar to those gifted to the artist by Monique Dion, owner and caretaker of the United Church of Phillipsburg, the vitally important Eastern Township's uh, uh, Lake Champlain station stop on the Underground Railroad. Tress, Mesh de Cheveux, is the, art, the artist's response to the call, where do we go from here, chaos or community, posed by African-American social justice campaigner Martin Luther King Jr. in his 1976 publication of the same name. 
I want to end my talk this evening with a call to action. If you or your families have stories, artifacts, artifacts or experiences related to Black histories and realities in the region, whether these be related in French or in English, and which you feel should belong to our collective memories of the townships, consider being in touch with the Eastern Townships Resource Center to share these. This Black Histories exhibit has never sought to present a complete or total portrait of the Black histories in the region, because that is a very large collective project that requires multiple and differing perspectives, especially those from Black communities in the region today. With this exhibit, we humbly hope to plant seeds for future conversations about Black history, culture, and life in this place. Thank you. Merci. Let's go. All right. Um, so there are a few questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Negum. It's very interesting. Uh, so much to learn, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the exhibit myself. Um, I would ask uh, our viewers to put their questions in the Q&A section. That way it's a little easier to decipher from uh, the hellos in the chat. Um, we had a first question. Someone is asking if it's possible to obtain uh, the bibliography uh, from your um, talk. Yes. Uh, I think, yeah, Fabian, can we make it available on the ETRC website? Yes, we will do that. Perfect. Okay, the next question is from Mustango Bay. In the course of your research, have you come across any stories of black people in the French part of the townships, Frontenac County, Lac Mégantic? If yes, could you expand on this topic? I personally have not, but that doesn't mean that uh, they weren't there because there's still so much research I need to do and I'm, I hope other people will be doing and maybe have already done. So I don't want to say that uh, we don't have the information. I don't. I'm not aware of it. But um, but I hope to. I hope to be aware of whatever information we do have so far. Thank you. One more question. What shocked you in this research? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think I, uh, I don't know if this shocked me, but I certainly was surprised to learn just how crazy the townships went for jazz in the 19, in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, it sounds like it was an interesting time to be here. And it sounds like, um, you know, I, I was, I guess I was surprised to learn that there was that much black cultural inf influence in the townships from people coming from elsewhere, uh, especially j uh, black jazz bands from Montreal uh, to the townships and, and, and circulating. And um, that was interesting to learn about. I, uh, I, and I really hope to continue to do more research on that topic. Um, and maybe, you know, publish something a little bit more in depth about that particular period and uh, phenomenon in, in townships history. Um, I'll keep thinking if something else comes up to, uh, comes up about what shocked me about this research, I'll, I'll chime in again on that. Thank you. Um, Dwayne Wilkin asks, thank you. Well, first of all, says congratulations for this exhibit in the lecture. What sort of archival documents do you suspect may exist in the smaller archives of the townships? Yeah, thanks, Dwayne, for your question. Um, I this is, you know, I'm I'm guessing here, so um, I hope I'm not wildly off base, but um, my guesses would be that um, some of the documents would include newspaper articles um, about Black presence in the region. Um, and, you know, if we were really lucky, we might come across a photo or two. Um, I know that uh, there's an archive uh, in Victoriaville, uh, the Arthur, uh, Arthur Baskar archive that does have a photo that is presented in the exhibit uh, of a, a Black domestic servant from the early 20th century. Um, but we don't know very much about her. We know her name was Martha, and that's pretty much what we know. I, you know, if I'm speculating, or, or I guess what I'm really, I'm really, you know, I'm wondering if she was one of the women from Guadalupe, 
And I would love to, you know, find if anyone knows anything or any has any tips about how to find out more about this woman, um, I would be very, uh, very eager uh, to, to find out more. Um, but yeah, beyond photo, maybe photos, um, I think mostly newspaper articles is what I'm guessing. Um, beyond that, I, I don't really have any guesses. Um, I would like to be surprised. Thank you. A few of our viewers are asking questions about the Underground Railroad. So we talked about that a little bit. Um, some people are asking what part did the Eastern Townships play in the Underground Railroad? Some people are asking um, uh, about, uh, some people are not quite aware of it. Uh, was that close to Sherbrooke at all or only more like New York or Lake Champlain? It was, um, it was north of Vermont uh, in Phillipsburg. Uh, in the Rome Missisqua MRC. There's a station there uh, that can be visited. Um, so yeah, it was a, um, the, it was a station, the, the, I think the station uh, before the station in Phil Phillipsburg was a station called in Swanton, Vermont. And then the next one, you know, from what I can understand is, was in Phillipsburg. And so the Eastern Townships um, were part of the Underground Railroad. Um, one thing I think um, people uh, don't realize, and actually this is something I learned, you know, relatively recently in the scheme of things, is that um, the Underground Railroad actually went in the opposite direction <laughs> at a certain point in time because uh, slavery was, um, ab abolition happened in some of the northern US, US states, including Vermont, earlier than it happened in the British Empire. And so um, at one point in time, uh, people would have been, you know, leaving Quebec, enslaved Black people in Quebec would have been going south uh, to the US on the Underground Railroad. And then uh, that direction switched uh, with in 1834 with the with the uh, with abolition across the British Empire. Uh, that's that, that's not, you know, I'm I'll be transparent. This that this particular um, topic is not something I've done a lot of research about. I'm not an expert on the Underground Railroad. I know other people are, so I'm looking forward to learning more about that. But I do invite people to learn more about uh, the station in Phillipsburg. Um, and, and also the role the Methodist, Methodist church played. You know, it said that um, when, uh, when there would be for, uh, outsiders coming through the town, the bells of the Methodist, Methodist church in Phillipsburg would be rung to warn people, uh, to freedom seekers uh, and their accomplices to, to hide. Um, so that's one story that we have that's been passed down in oral histories about uh, about uh, black black histories in 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 the Bromisquisqua uh, region. Thank you. Erin um, Hurley asks, where will you look next for your sources on black histories in the townships? Oh, um, I would really like to do some oral histories collections uh, because I know that a lot of people have them. <laughs> and uh, I'm, you know, I, I studied literature. I'm fascinated by storytelling. And um, I think that uh, I want to look, yeah. So the next place to look is in, in the people, in people and in their stories. <laughs> That's the next one. Okay, um, do you know how important the loyalist immigration movement to the townships was on black immigration? Well, well I know that that it was important when loyal, white, white loyalists brought uh, enslaved people to the region. So in that sense, it was, you know, important for kind of early days of black life uh, in the region. And, you know, the work that these people did um, some of it was in households, so some of it was domestic labor. Um, they would, you know, take care of the cooking and cleaning and child rearing and perhaps midwifing. Um, and then, uh, but we also know that they, you know, cleared lands and uh, they worked in the potash, potash industry. Um, <clears throat> so it wasn't only domestic work that they were doing. Um, th that's 
for for the moment that's that's what i'm aware of but perhaps i'm sure there's there's still more to discover for sure mm -hmm. um jacqueline madison asks do you have any information on formerly escaped slaves from north america from north america well i invite you to uh check out um Sorry, Fabian, do we know is the exhibit still happening at the Musée de Musée de d'Histoire de Sherbrooke? Okay, so this Thursday, there's a really cool exhibit um, that is opening in at the Sherbrooke History Museum. That is about, I think it's called, it's called Fugitif or run, Runaway. Uh, and it's about uh, runaway uh, enslaved people uh, that are more correctly known as freedom seekers uh, across Quebec. Uh, and it's uh, being rented, it was created by uh, the historian and rapper Webster, who I spoke of earlier. Uh, and so he, I think, I believe he first, first, first uh, launched it in Quebec City, where he's based. And now the Sherbrooke History Museum is renting the exhibit. And I believe that they've added a little uh, volet local or a little kind of local component uh, to the exhibit. Uh, so I'm very excited to check out uh, what they're what they're presenting. And I I hope that you you know you you check it out. I think it's also it's it is also uh, virtual. So there's a virtual version of it that you can check out online. It's called Fugitif. Uh, and it's by Webster. Thank you. Um, so I have a question that is answered a little later by another sort of question. Um, someone's asking who's in charge of the site in Phillipsburg? And I believe that's Madame Monique Dion. Um, we own the Methodist Church in Phillipsburg. Contact us at, well, we can share that email address a little later. Um, da -da 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 -da. Do you know about the burial ground of several black remains in the Eastern townships? Yes, um, I, I believe this person is referencing a uh, rock that has been known as N-word rock uh, for a long time um, that is said to contain the remains of um, formerly enslaved people and then servants that for they could have been, it's possible that they were freed by that point, um, but still working in servitude. Um, and this there i know that there um have this is in the bromisisqua area as well um in saint armand and um it's on private property um and so there there have been uh there have been activist movements for over the past 20 years to have it officially recognized as a federal and provincial heritage site um and the leader of that movement was a, a historian named Hank Avery, who I believe now lives in Nova Scotia, but he was the town's only black resident and, and a history teacher. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, the newspaper records in that in Roma Sisqua, you can see that at different points in time there were um, there was kind of a, a, a reinvigoration of a movement to have it officially recognized. It is recognized as a heritage site, I believe, by the town, and I'm perhaps the province. Though I'm, I, I have to double check that. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't, don't believe it's been recognized uh, federally, though. Okay. Um, I have another question, but before I forget, someone was inquiring about the transcript of this, um, uh, of our, of our event this evening. Um, I mean, the, I think the, um, the 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 recording will be available. The transcript is that something as well? Yeah, the could recording. Be uh, I it, possibly the recording will be available. I have to rewatch it and see how it went. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't see why uh, we can't publish the transcript of of tonight's talk along with the bibliography on the ETRC website. I think Thank that you. should be fine. Okay, so this is a two-part question. Is it correct to say that in the black people, uh, the black people that first came to the townships, either as domestics, help or slaves, or pass through more in entertainment, music, and sports? I guess this might have been more adults, possibly not families. That's the first question. And yeah, the the other part of the question is: Do you know when black people began to settle in the townships, not in relation to domestic help slash slavery? Sorry, yes, I'm sorry, Sonia. Could you please repeat the yes. first question? Yes, the first, the first part is more like a statement. Okay. Is it correct to say that the black people first, the first, you know, 
Black people first came to the townships either as domestics, domestic help, or slaves, or passed through more in a entertainment, music, and sport context. The person says, I guess this might have been more adults, possibly not families, question mark. Okay, so it is, I think, yes, it is correct to say that the first Black people in the townships came as slaves uh, or, and or uh, servants. And then, and then there was a wave of cultural producers, musicians, perform, mostly musicians, um, and then athletes. Um, and the whether they were adult, well, that we know that the first enslaved people uh, that came to uh, that was brought, they were brought by Philip Fluke to Saint Armand. Uh, there were several children. I think the youngest one was five years old. Um, and then there were a few teenagers. Um, so I think actually more of them were children uh, than there, they were adults, the, the first black enslaved people in the townships. The domestic servants, I know that the women from Guadeloupe uh, were as young as 15 or 16 years of age. Um, they were generally pretty young. Um, and some of them were joining their, you know, other sisters uh, who had, had previously come you know, we have accounts of, you know, sisters meeting in the Windsor Port of Montreal after not seeing each other for a long time. Um, and then what was the second question? Sorry. The other part of the question is, do you know when Black people began to settle in the townships, not in relation to domestic help or slavery? Right. Um, I think that it's, there's a, a it's scattered. Um, certainly, we see more of an increase in the, the 60s and 70s than before. Before that, it's kind of like a trick calling. Um, and then, um, yeah, I think that since the 60s, 70s, it's, it continues to grow. And certainly in the past, you know, 10 years, we've seen, you know, we've seen it like um, grow quite, quite a lot more than we've seen it in any one period. <clears throat> okay. Well, I think that answers most of our questions and we sort of have to wrap up. Um, so like we said a little earlier, we are gonna be able to uh, provide the uh, recording and possibly the transcript. And without further ado, I introduce you to the ETRC's executive director, Fabian Will. Well, uh, thanks Sonia. Uh, and thanks for animating this evening. That was really nice, thank you. Uh, so good evening, everyone. Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, uh, we are almost at the end of our 22nd Robin Burns lecture and the exhibit lounge. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone who contributed to this project, everyone who provided texts based on their research, uh, provided comments and review in the process when we were working on the exhibit, and also those who provided art pieces uh, to illustrate the exhibition and everyone who's going to share the exhibit in its uh, network. Um, but I also want to thank especially you, Sunita. Uh, it was a wonderful cooperation. Uh, it was a great pleasure working with you. And I hope it's not the last time that we do something. Yeah, he's the best collaborator, <laughs> an amazing designer. All of his, he needs, to, he gets credit for the design of the exhibit. He's really a visionary when it comes to these things. <laughs> <laughs>